Okay. Waiting for the attendees to filter in. Jay, do you know how many people are registered for today? Um, it's we usually have between 40 and 50 people show up for any webinar, but okay. Um, yeah, well, it, we'll have to wait and see how many people show up. Perfect. Yeah, we'll just wait a couple minutes for everybody to jump on. Can they hear yeah. us already, Jay? Sorry. Uh, right now, yeah, everyone can hear us. Yes. Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Gateway Lecture Series. We're just going to wait uh, another minute or so to see when our participant numbers sort of level out so we're not missing the, the mass influx of people. Um, but my name's Sam, for those of you who are joining right now, uh, and I'm gonna be the moderator for today's talk. So I'll just be going over some introductions um, and then I'll also be doing closing remarks at the end um, of today's talk. It looks like we're holding pretty steady at 35 participants right now, which is nice. People were on the ball ready for the talk, which is always good. Um, so I think I'm just going to kick it off with the introductions here, and that'll give people who might be joining us a little bit later some time before the actual talk starts. Um, so thank you, everybody who is here for joining us today. Um, and this marks Gateway's 15th uh, Rural Health Lecture Series. Uh, and we greatly appreciate all the support that we've got and all the interest um, that we have uh, contributing to this knowledge economy uh, that we're putting out towards rural health. Um, so as I said, my name's Sam. I'm a research assistant at Gateway Center of Excellence in Rural Health. Uh, we are located in Goderich, Ontario, and we are the only rural research institute in Canada that we know of. And we're governed by a completely community-based volunteer board, um, and they aim to advance the rural health teaching and research across Huron, Perth, Gray, and Bruce counties. Our mission is to improve the health and quality of life of rural residents through research, education, and communication. And beginning in February of 2021, Gateway launched its first virtual lecture series uh, with social isolation being at top of mind uh, as COVID-19 restrictions continued to heighten. We thought there was truly no better time to launch this initiative um, as through these lecture series, our hope is to cultivate a culture of rural health knowledge and innovation while virtually connecting communities to reduce social isolation at the same time. Uh, and today we are very excited to have our keynote speaker as Cassandra Bryant. Uh, Cassandra works closely with Gateway on a few different research projects, um, one being the topic of today's lecture, um, which I'll let her introduce once I pass it over. Uh, she's a PhD student in rural studies in the School of Environmental Design and Rural Development at the University of Guelph. And her research interests include women-led rural social enterprise, the social economy, community development and the health and wellness among rural healthcare workers, uh, as well as the labor market linked to the COVID-19 pandemic. She has been a nonprofit organization consultant uh, for over 16 years, working in strategic consulting, donor stewardship and constituent relationship management. Uh, and she is also the, a social entrepreneur as she has launched her own business called Change in Zero, um, which provides education and capacity development for individuals and communities to take steps towards um, addressing the climate crisis. And if you're interested in checking out that endeavor of hers, it is www.changeintzero.com and that's C-H-A-N-G-E-N-T. Z Z E R zero dot com. Sorry. <laughs> um, and we're also lucky to have two wonderful panelists joining us today. We do have Bonnie Bainham as well as Leith Deacon. Uh, we are missing Al Lozon. You might have seen him on some of the promotional content. He unfortunately had some family emergency to attend to today. So we will miss him, um, but he is where he needs to be. Um, Bonnie Bainham is here and she is the project lead for Be Well, Work Well here in Perth. Um, Be Well, Work Well is a community-based research project which focuses on exploring the impact of COVID-19, mental health, and substance use on the labor force in Huron and Perth counties. And the project uh, is one that's associated with Gateway Center of Excellence in Rural Health. Uh, Bonnie has also enjoyed a 40-year career working with diverse sectors of the nonprofit space, uh, including most recently as a community developer for here in Perth Public Health, and she has a passion for working with community at all levels, including a special interest in advocacy in the areas of mental health, equity, inclusion, and diversity. Uh, and then finally, last but not least, we do have Leith Deacon, uh, who is a research chair with Gateway in Rural Resiliency. And when Leith is not volunteering with Gateway, he's working at his regular job as an associate professor with the School of Environmental Design and Rural Development at the University of Guelph. So we're very pleased to have him with us today as well. 
Uh, so we'll kick off the discussion here and I'll turn things over to Cassandra to start with her initial talk. Great, thank you so much, Sam. All right, so I'm just going to share the screen here. Just wanna make sure, thumbs up, everyone can see the screen okay? Excellent, okay. So <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. I am very happy to be here today to present this month's Gateway Lecture Series, The Cost of Caring, The Consequences of the Pandemic for Rural Healthcare Workers, a preliminary exploration. As Sam mentioned, my name is Cassandra Bryant and I am with the University of Guelph and a research associate with Gateway. And I have had the privilege to work on three research projects connected to Gateway, today being one of them. And specifically, we will be exploring preliminary results from the second phase of research, which is currently still being conducted. I will let you know that I am fighting a non-COVID cold right now, so I apologize if I sneeze or anything like that throughout the presentation, but I just wanted to give you a heads up. And I also wanted to let you know or preface that today's lecture is really focused on the challenges that healthcare workers are facing. There are many beautiful stories and silver linings as a result of the pandemic. However, we will save that for another day. So for today's agenda, I will provide a snapshot of the research study and present four main themes, the stressors and sources of support for rural healthcare workers, uh, we're a look at leadership and management and establishing a real context in mental health. As Sam had already introduced, we did have our panel and, and as I said, um, Al will not be here today, but he is the principal investigator of the study and also my PhD advisor. Uh, he was going to speak about the impact of the pandemic from a rural sector leadership lens, and hopefully we'll hear about that maybe later on in a future lecture series. Dr. Leith Deacon will speak further to the rural context, especially with his involvement in other studies in Huron County. And then the lovely Bonnie Bainham will speak to the mental health and wellness piece. And this is a key aspect of the study. And I look forward to engaging with the panel a little later on. So in June 2020, Gateway and your University of Guelph conducted a survey on the stressors and sources of support for rural healthcare workers in Huron County. We wanted to know how healthcare workers were doing and managing at the start of the pandemic. The second phase of the research began this year in April, and it's still running, as I had mentioned. We are conducting interviews with past survey respondents and have included two other groups to the study. The first group are our key informant interviews, those that have been supporting rural healthcare workers throughout the pandemic, such as social workers, psychiatrists, and psychologists. And the second group is personal support workers. Now, June 2020 seems like a long time ago. Uh, in fact, this week officially marks the two-year anniversary of the survey that we did. Some may question the relevancy of conducting a second phase of research two years later, and others may wonder if past participants remembered what they said, felt, or experienced. One thing is certain, the memories, the feelings, and the experiences are most assuredly relevant and continue to be up front and center for rural healthcare workers in Huron County. And in fact, the pandemic uh, feels more far-reaching, the impacts of the pandemic feel more far-reaching now than in June 2020. I'll touch briefly upon the first phase that we did again back in 2020. It included the online survey and it was open to anyone in the healthcare sector in Huron County. We had 153 participants from various uh, employees in primary care, paramedics, public health, social support, and other sectors. Um, the main stressors identified included fear of infection, the PPE concerns at the time, being overworked, or an increase in workload. It was also about the constant change that was happening, management, communication challenges, and personnel shortages. At the time, less than 14% sought formal support, whether through the workplace, the government, or the healthcare sector. The majority of respondents relied on informal support in the form of family, friends, and the community. I'd like to introduce a running analogy we've been using for this research study, running a sprint to a marathon. In June, 2020, healthcare workers were running a sprint. It was all hands on deck, trying to figure out what to do and how to do it. Two years later, health, these healthcare workers are running a marathon and it's a marathon without a finish line, 
and as one participant shared, also without the required training to actually run a marathon. So take a moment to visualize this in your mind, that a never ending marathon without the training, uh, without training that you've been running for two years, how might that make you feel? And just keep that in mind for when we explore this a little later on. As we turn our attention to uh, the second phase of research, we have an opportunity to better understand the impact of the pandemic for healthcare workers in Huron County. You will notice on the slide, the lack of PSW interviews to date. The lack of representation is also reflected in our June 2020 survey. It has been a challenge to engage with PSWs and there are many reasons why this is the case. Yet we know this group in healthcare have been one of the most impacted by the pandemic. We are working hard to connect with PSWs and hope to interview at least five PSWs in long-term care and another five in home care. It really is important to have their voices heard in this study. And as mentioned, the study includes key informant interviews. The purpose is to provide insight on possible current mental health challenges for rural healthcare workers since the pandemic started. So again, we've had an opportunity to speak to social workers, psychotherapists, psychiatrists, and psychologists. The main objectives in the second phase are an extension to the survey, similar to conducting a longitudinal study. However, we have included an exploration on the workplace and government leadership management career life changes as a result of the pandemic, mental health, and identifying a rural context. With this being a preliminary exploration, meaning we are still in the data collection phase, we haven't had a chance to properly and fully analyze the data. So therefore, I will be highlighting findings through key concepts, ideas, and terms. So in a way, today, we are getting an opportunity to glimpse at some of the raw data. This slide uh, offers a loose timeline of stressors from June 2020 to present day. Most of the stressors are present in each phase. However, you can gain an appreciation of how the stressors are evolving or progressing. I would also like to add that not all stressors are included on this slide. So to begin with, I would like to touch upon two uh, key stressors, if you will, uh, beginning with the double whammy and the triple threat. So these two concepts were identified from the findings in the 2020 survey. The double whammy is the experience of uncertainty and stress of the pandemic at work and at home. There is no getting away from the pandemic. The triple threat is when you take on difficult duties, whether personally or professionally, that go above and beyond the paid work due to either a desire to help, a sense of obligation, or through pressure from others. The double whammy has lessened somewhat since the early pandemic. In 2020, especially with the uncertainty and fear of infection, many healthcare workers remained in isolation for fear of infecting others. We heard about those who decided to live elsewhere, separate from their families. We heard about people going through a sanitization process, such as taking off their clothes in the garage before entering the house, having a shower before they hugged family members. And we also heard about the immense isolation, especially for those who did not live with anyone else. Healthcare workers simply could not get away almost physically from the pandemic, whether at work or at home. The double whammy has evolved in a couple of ways, or a few ways. One of them is because of being overworked with limited to no vacation or days off, healthcare workers are unable to decompress or disconnect mentally, emotionally, and physically. There remains a hypervigilance even when at home. This also highlights the sense of anxiety or fear if that cell phone beeps or rings because it's most likely a request to come on in and take care of a shortage that is happening. And there really has not been the time or space for healthcare workers to recover or recuperate. The triple threat has remained consistent throughout the pandemic. As, we meant, as I mentioned earlier, the beginning uh, of the pandemic was a sprint with all hands on deck. And while there may have been a pause in the summer of 2020, when the pandemic seemed to hit urban areas before it did rule, it did eventually arrive. Healthcare workers were and are being asked to help out in the community, such as the vaccination clinics, help out in other departments, even if not fully trained, take on extra duties, such as paramedics who were not allowed to administer the vaccine, but 
were allowed to do so, and even helping with the distribution of vaccines on their time off. One respondent shared she would distribute, uh, she would help uh, distribute vaccines on her time off. So on her way to work or from work or on her days off in between appointments, she would be picking up and dropping off vaccines to the different areas that needed them. Additionally, uh, there are those who officially retired before the pandemic or maybe at the early pandemic who were asked to come back. And as one respondent shares, the, there's pressure from above, but there's also pressure that if you phone in sick or if you're burnt out, you're leaving your friends or your coworkers in the lurch. I'd like to introduce one of the main findings thus far, uh, something we are calling pandemic burnout. Burnout is something we may have experienced either at home uh, uh, sorry, at home or sorry, at different times in our career or at different stages of our life. Burnout can be defined as a state of emotional, physical, and mental exhaustion caused by excessive and prolonged stress. It occurs when you feel overwhelmed, emotionally drained, and unable to meet constant demands. Many, if not all, participants are discussing burnout. We hope to explore this in more depth once we have completed the data collection, but you can get an idea of what it means by looking at the word cloud, which includes the phrases and words used by participants. So this word cloud alone really showcases the complexity and the severity of the pandemic burnout, something of which we are beginning and already experiencing the consequences of today. There's two characteristics I'd like to highlight that may delineate pandemic burnout from burnout. One being its collective nature. Everyone is experiencing burnout across the board. It's not happening in isolation or in few individual cases. Secondly, because of its collective nature, the possible repercussions in the healthcare industry and our society can be immense. There's an exodus of human resources that leads to a, a crisis like personnel shortage, as well as the growing mental health crisis among healthcare workers. I'd like to share another concept, and it's the idea of the hero. We have called and continue to call our healthcare workers heroes, along with all essential workers throughout the pandemic. But let's take a look at this more closely. A hero is admired or idealized for courage, outstanding achievements, and noble or noble qualities, something I believe we can agree with when we think of our healthcare workers. But let's take another look at how a hero is portrayed in the movies. Typically, it's a lonely individual, with many foes and few friends attempting to do the impossible with very little support to overcome great odds. This does not sound so appealing. So while many healthcare workers feel supported, grateful and appreciative of the support that they're getting, there is a growing hero resentment, if you will, among healthcare workers. Some feel that hero is a little over the top or they experience incredible guilt if they can't sustain the ability to go above and beyond. There is also emotional pain tied to the idea of being a hero, especially when one at one moment is lauded as a hero and in the next moment is a villain. This can be seen with recent current events such as the truckers convoy or when the government releases new mandates and protocols around vaccine availability and boosters. One respondent shared, you call us heroes and spend all this energy telling us how wonderful we are, but look at how we're treated, especially the verbal abuse from the public. You call us heroes because we keep going, we keep, uh, we put on that cape and we keep on going. The amount of guilt is incredible. I'd like to shift a little bit to the support now um, and talk about access to and sources of support for rural healthcare workers in Huron County. And for the purpose of this study, formal support is support access through the workplace, healthcare system or government, and informal support is really through friends, family, social networks, community, and colleagues. This slide here uh, provides a table on the various types of support for healthcare workers. It is not an exhaustive list by any means. The arrows indicate either a perceived increase in access, decrease in access, or both depending on personal experience. Again, we will have to properly analyze the data, but it does hopefully provide an indication in how people are accessing or not accessing support. And I'll touch upon a couple of these items here. So the first one is that the EAP program, the Employee Assistance Program, is simply not enough. It is just three sessions or four sessions, and that's not enough to really even start to begin to uncover the breadth of challenges that healthcare workers are facing. 
Approximately a year into the pandemic, an overwhelming amount of online resources and websites were made available through various departments, means, and so forth. However, getting this information to healthcare workers and the right kind of information was a challenge. And frankly, people are tired of having to do research online for their health. Workshops are available through the workplace, but again, one of the challenges there is just trying to time their work time plus off time and trying to fit it in. And a lot of times the time and energy just weren't there to be able to take advantage of some of those workshops that a lot of healthcare workers said that they really appreciated, but they just couldn't get there. For some, the benefits package only provides $300 a year to access mental health support. So this is the equivalent to two or two and a half sessions. And there is a reticence to ask for mental health support through the family doctor or family health team. In terms of other mental health uh, service providers, not only is the cost an obstacle, but for some, there is guilt around accessing mental health support. Some feel, and this is what came from one respondent, the carer should not be asking for care or burdening the mental health support system. Other health service providers, such as a chiropractor or a massage therapist or physiotherapist, there has definitely been an increase in demand for those services. And I won't speak too much about government support at this time, but there seems to be concerns with wages. There was concern or um, hurt, if you will, around the unequal distribution of the 5,000 retentions retention bonus that was provided earlier this year through the government, and even having to jump through many hoops to just even get WSIB support. Interestingly, when it comes to informal support, there are two trends. There is a heavier reliance on colleagues. So an increase in colleague relationships and those relationships have deep, deeper connections. And this is something that is a change prior to pandemic or pre-pandemic. These are the folks who get it. And so conversations in the workplace or just even chatting outside of the workplace, whatever it may be, it's no longer, hey, how are you doing today? It's, hey, how are you doing today? Let's talk, let's take a few minutes. And so that has, there has been an increase in, in, in those relationships with colleagues. Family and friends are more for lightheartedness, escapism, non-related work connections. At the time of the study in June, 2020, there was more of a reliance on family and friends to help healthcare workers get through the pandemic. So this has shifted. There is some concern about not burdening family and friends or realizing that family and friends maybe don't have the capacity for that long-term sustainable support that they need. Additionally, healthcare workers want to protect their families and are trying to find ways to separate work and home. One of the objectives of the study is to explore how healthcare workers feel about workplace and government uh, leadership and management. For today, I'm just going to provide a few initial findings on workplace management and leadership. Um, and I would say probably some findings for government will do for another day. So there is a general understanding and acceptance and uh, support from healthcare workers that management has tried their best under the circumstances. However, there's no denying the fact that there is distrust and some resentment that is occurring in the workplace. And I'll touch upon a couple of them that are here on the slide. One of them is still around PPE. So when PPE mandates were relaxed earlier this year, one nurse shared her decision to maintain full PPE, but was pulled aside by a doctor and pressured to relax on what she was wearing because it was sending the wrong message to patients and family members. She felt her own personal safety was compromised or less important than the perception that the virus was not as such a strong threat anymore. Early on in the pandemic, paramedics were also told to be careful how many N95 masks they used due to this shortage, which they also felt uh, was at the cost of their own safety. And one other quick story, there was one where some paramedics were at a site and they had to um, help someone on the first floor of an apartment building, the concerns and fears around um, the, the virus, and then also trying to save your PPE. One police officer actually did not go through the building, but decided to climb through the window to get to that individual there to try to help maintain, you know, their, their PPE that they had on hand. Communication 
Um, there has been a lack of communication or consistent messaging. Um, it seems to be a key issue. Again, this is not reflective of management, but really just the whole pandemic as, as a whole. But we can, uh, we can appreciate that workplace management is and continues to do their best best, but the inconsistencies and sometimes contradictory information or messaging does remain a challenge. One respondent also shared that if workplace management was more transparent, even with the challenges that they're facing, it would help create a better understanding and more of a team environment in the workplace. The increased expectations is one of the biggest challenges when it comes to workplace leadership and management. And again, a lot of times hands are tied, but more is expected from staff, longer hours, overextending job descriptions and denied vacation to name a few. For many, they are forced to call in sick if they have to attend to their own health appointments. One healthcare worker shared that she was thankful for her own healthcare crisis that resulted in a surgery and a mandatory multi-week leave. This was the only time she felt refreshed since the start of the pandemic. Others who have personally built in feel that they are being questioned why they are taking that leave. And lastly, some healthcare workers feel really incredible guilt if they do take a personal or sick day. They know the domino effect that this has in the workplace in terms of shortages. And this really leads to many overextending themselves until they themselves are in a health crisis like the one I just shared. It seems the message potentially, and again, this is just more perception from healthcare workers, but it can be interpreted as, as that you must be in crisis mode in order to take time off and not before then. Many have shared that the small gestures at work, such as the lunches and treats, are incredibly, incredibly thoughtful and have really helped them through some really uh, dark times. But knowing that the nature of the pandemic and the stressors, especially when we're looking at pandemic burnout, exhaustion and stress, the support needs to shift a little bit. So staff are asking for more proactive measures to address burnout, mental health, and overall job satisfaction. And a couple of participants shared it would be in management's best interest to have a better balance between retention as they are trying to recruit. <laughs> so that was just something that was interesting. Another objective uh, for phase two is establishing a rule context as we did not explicitly apply a rule lens in the June 2020 study. Most of the rural challenges experienced by healthcare workers are perennial rural issues. For example, transportation, lack of resources, and a lack of infrastructure have really been exacerbated during the pandemic. Transportation, whether rising gas prices or a lack of transportation, has impacted the healthcare sector and those they serve. People lost their mode of transportation, especially if it was a neighbor or a family member or friend, for fear of sharing an enclosed space of a car. Many patients had to just simply forego necessary appointments and services. On the plus side with transportation, the shift to online or hybrid delivery of services was a positive outcome for a number of people, both healthcare workers and for patients. I've touched upon the personnel shortage a number of times already, and this really has been a challenge for rural areas, you know, the attracting and retention of talent to live and work in rural communities. I believe it was around 2005, and correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, a nursing and healthcare shortage was predicted 10 to 15 years in the future. This did not take into consideration a global pandemic. In 2019, the National Syndicate of Nursing Professionals also predicted a global shortage of 18 million healthcare workers or professionals by the year of 2030. Again, this was written prior to the pandemic. And lastly, an article by the Ontario Nurses Association, which I'm sure some of you have come across already this spring, wrote an article titled Going, Going, Gone, Overwhelmed, Disrespected, and Fed Up. Ontario nurses and healthcare professionals are leaving in droves. What will it take to stop the exodus? If this is happening at a global level, one can only imagine the impact it has on rural areas. And also, um, it, it, it must be noted too that rural healthcare workers are moving up their retirement dates, they're changing career paths, and simply leaving the sector. Infrastructure is another perennial rural challenge that has been exacerbated by the pandemic. In speaking with a handful of paramedics, 
uh, paramedics at times were not only locked out of their satellite base office offices, but also locked in to, in the offices. One respondent shared that while uh, one of their satellite base bases was located in a long term care facility, and it went into lockdown without letting them know. So when they tried to leave to respond to a call, they had to take time to find someone to, uh, to let them out of the facility. Another paramedic had shared that at different times during the pandemic, they were turned away from facilities, not only because beds were full, but because there was not enough staff and they lost precious time to get care for patients. And not only were they closing, but rural areas were overwhelmed with patients that were coming in from urban areas. And we understand that when you live in a rural community, people are going to know who you are. This has been keenly felt by healthcare workers during the pandemic. Healthcare workers are forced into being role models in the community. Going to the grocery store is not simply going to the grocery store anymore. Healthcare workers are hyper vigilant on if they've got the PPE and if they're practicing social distancing and doing all the things that they should be doing as a role model. For some, going to the grocery store has actually become anxiety riddled and some have opted out to just do the pickup curbside service from this point forward. Hopefully that'll change in the future. But, but clearly the lines between Sally, the healthcare worker and Sally, the community member are blurred. Healthcare workers feel they are under the microscope when they step out into the community. And this does reflect the double whammy that I spoke about earlier where there's no getting away from the pandemic one respondent shared how a PSW colleague in her time off had people to her house outside practicing social distancing during the summer. Yet a neighbor had called the PSW's place of work to, to tell on them. And as the respondent shared, this sent a big chill through the workplace as they were being watched and being held at a, held at a higher standard. There are also challenges and pressures within family and friends circles, especially around PPE safety protocols and COVID and vaccine beliefs. This was especially felt when mandates were lifted this March. One participant shared she was pressured by her own family to not wear a mask in public. Major rifts have been created between family and friends on where people stand in their beliefs and practices. And while this is not specific to rural health care, we understand that the tight knit communities and strong social fabric in rural areas that these challenges are only magnified. Participants also feel the stigma around mental health and, and that it's more entrenched in rural areas. On a positive note, many do feel the stigma is changing or becoming less of a stigma as a result of the pandemic. So there's one little silver lining there. But while this may be the case, there is a fear around a lack of perceived anonymity, especially if a healthcare worker seeks mental health support. One participant shared it was too much to handle if they cross paths, such as in a restaurant with their therapist. So some participants feel they would most likely go out of county to increase that sense of safety and confidentiality. Other final thoughts in terms of rule, the rural context, you know, some of them are that there's a perceived uh, access to care seems more inaccessible in rural than compared to urban, that there's also a rural patient personality, which I thought was interesting. And, and, and what that means is that preferring to handle things on their own, but also a reluctance to access care. Uh, there is the possibility of more orphans or unattached patients that don't have a family doctor or health team. And while I understand and appreciate that Huron County actually has a high percentage of attached patients, that is still something that's a rural issue. And there is a sense that urban is more heavily resourced compared to rural, so that rural gets the leftovers, especially when it comes to human resources and funding. So with this in mind, I'll turn our attention to mental health and well-being. So as we explore the stressors of the pandemic on rural healthcare workers, we are also asking participants how they feel about their health and the possible short and long-term consequences. Many have shared concerns about their overall health, but especially with an emphasis on their mental health. Think back to that running analogy, the marathon without a finish line or proper training, and consider those words that you read in that word cloud when, we, uh, when I introduced the pandemic burnout. We've had a chance to conduct those key informant interviews, as I said, with social workers, psychiatrists, psychotherapists, and psychologists. And we asked them to define mental health. Interestingly, this made most 
people pause. Two key informants shared that while this is the work they do, uh, they've never really paused or intentionally defined mental health. And we tend to bandy that word around quite a lot. This slide shares a handful of definitions from key informants. Keywords include psychological well being and functioning, ability to cope, and it's tied to emotional, social, and physical wellness. And I appreciate the one sentence on the ability to flourish. To date, there is a sense that mental health of rural healthcare workers has been impacted. Short term concerns are the ability to cope, manage, and handle life. There is guilt and concern about delivering the quality of care that they once did and that that's not there anymore. One respondent shared an analogy to highlight the state of mental health and it's a little bit bleak, but I think it's important to share that healthcare workers are walking in the abyss of, a dark, the abyss of darkness in a cave without a light at the end. There is also a possible loss of pride in their profession. One key informant shared that a community member lovingly made some fabulous custom masks for nurses at the beginning of the pandemic. They had hospital designs on them. Some of them had RN stitched on them. She shared that nurses wore these masks with pride at the beginning of the pandemic, but now they don't wear them because they don't want to be identified in the community. So as we consider mental health implications in the long term, there are a number of factors to really look at. The level of resilience of healthcare workers, the level of burnout, knowing that people are leaving now and that the personnel shortage is happening now, quality of care and how that is being impacted. Um, and then there is also the breaking point. And I've been asking the key informant interviews about what is that breaking point. It's really looking at when healthcare workers can no longer work or they feel that there is no uh, work-life balance or that their quality of life has been severely impacted. And really that that quality of care is already being impacted there. And then there's the appropriate resources. As one key informant shared, it's not about offering more resources, but a redistribution of them. What is making people feel overworked? How do they feel when, how do they feel when their work matters? Does the culture of the organization make people feel valued and supported? So it's really about asking what is really needed. So there is obviously so much more I could talk about, but I think that's where we will end today. Um, and I would love to uh, bring it over to our lovely panel uh, today. Uh, thanks, uh, Bonnie and Leith. And so the first one there, that was a question that Al would have spoken to um, today because he is also involved in a study just on the impact of the pandemic for healthcare uh, leadership and management. It would have been great to have that. But again, we'll hopefully have that in a future lecture series. So Bonnie, I'd like to ask you, um, just after looking at some of the um, concerns and, and, and thoughts and what's come up around mental health, I'd love to hear from you about what is mental health to you and then to have your reflections on what was shared today. Thank you very much, Cassandra. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, you, you know, did have the privilege of having a little bit of time to prepare my thoughts on, on what mental health, uh, what it means to me. Um, so I wrote it down so that I wouldn't mess it up. So I wrote this, good mental health allows you to feel, think and act in ways that help you enjoy your life and cope with its challenges. And this can be um, positively or negatively impacted by such, things, such factors like our life experiences, relationships with others, where, the place where we live, um, our work or school environments. Um, and you know, over the, over the last couple of years, um, during the pandemic, of course, I've worked at public health. Now, I was one of those people who left public health and retired last May. Um, but of course, I'm still connected to a lot of those people, you know, a lot of those professionals who've experienced the pandemic and still are. And I am seeing those outcomes with, with my friends, with my networks. And um, we've had a lot of conversations about um, you know, that continuum, you know, of mental health. So we often hear people talking about mental health, uh, but really what they're talking about is mental illness, you know? So I think that when we think about mental health and what we've all been through on some level through the pandemic is, um, I'm, all, I'm a community developer, so I'm always thinking about how does community approach this? And I think that's, I think that's the space where, we will find the energy and the resources and the collaborations to actually address 
um, what's just happened to all of us in the last couple of years. So mental health is about community too. It's, it's on an individual basis, but that, um, you know, it rolls over into community, into the grocery store, into our hospitals, um, into our neighbors' homes and our homes. So I think it's, it's a big topic. <laughs> and Cassandra, I really appreciate the work you've done in this so far because it fits really well with um, our Be Well, Work Well uh, study. And I'll let the researcher at least speak to that a little bit more. That sounds great. And before we switch over to Leith, I just want to reflect on a couple of things there, Bonnie, that with what you're saying, when people think of mental health, they may assume mental illness. And one, uh, one respondent had said, we have to think about mental health as more mental wellness, not mental illness. And just as we take the time to exercise or think about our physical health, we should be applying the same amount of energy and dedication to our mental wellness or health. So that was one piece I just wanted to reflect that you had shared that piece there. Yeah, and it's true. It is, you know, um, you can't have mental health without physical health. And you can't have physical health without mental health. They're connected. You know, and I think most of us accept that we should go out and exercise, you know, that we should go out and get our physical activity. Um, but I don't think we're, we're right there yet when it comes to the health of our minds. What are your thoughts, Bonnie, on the sense that the stigma around mental health is lessening or it's changing because of the pandemic? What are your thoughts on that? Um, I, I'm not sure it is changing. Um, I mean, I would like to believe it is. And, and I think language is really important. Um, so Cassandra, you've mentioned that a couple of times um, throughout your presentation. I think it's changing. You know, language is really important and how we use our, our language around mental health um, and using mental well-being when we're talking about health mm -hmm. um, in a more positive way. So we're kind of switching it up. It's a little bit easier for people to understand generally too. Um, that we're, we're all striving for mental and physical health and well-being. Mm -hmm. So, because I think mental health is just confusing to people. Um, and I think we need, we've got a lot of work to do yet around, um, you know, uh, when we are talking about mental, when we are talking about illness, um, that we, we spend some time talking about stigma and its impact on people's access to services, their willingness to access services. Oh, anyway, I could go on and on. Um, <laughs> but making it acceptable, you know, as part of our overall health, I think it's crucial. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you for that. You're um, I'd like to ask Leith about the rural context findings of the study thus far. As I had mentioned, a lot of them are, are historical issues in rural to begin with, and really they're being exacerbated, but there are a couple of interesting things there in terms of relationship dynamics that may be unique, maybe, but I'm just curious what your reflections are on the findings. Well, I, I think, first of all, um, I think, first of all, the concept of rural and rurality has mm -hmm. to be recognized. And the, I mean, this is a rural health group. So I think it's preaching to the choir a little bit, of course, but it is, it's a contested term of what rural, of what rural even means, first of all. So um, I'm born and raised in rural, and by that I mean general store rural. So really, like, I think the real rural, as most people would, would qualify it as such. But I currently live in Fergus, and like, let's be honest, it has a Starbucks. But Fergus is a rural community by all, by all definition, and that's the thing. Uh, rural simply not in contrast to urban. It's a place that's you know got a set of complex set of variables, and it differentiates between rural communities. Okay, so I think that's really important. The other thing that's critical to con consider when you're talking about rural is that it's changing. It is not static, and these are dynamic places. And often those changes are more noticeable in these smaller rural communities than they are in those larger urban centers. And COVID has exacerbated these changes. For example, things like urban to rural migration has drastically increased over the last two years. Just take a look at housing prices. But this is causing rapidly changing economies. It's diversifying our culture. And all of these things must be considered when we start to think about supports, responses, plans, policies. I don't like the word solution, but solutions to talking about mental health in rural contexts. So that's the first thing. I really think that's critical. 
Rural is not a monolith, and I purposely did not wear a plaid shirt today because rural is not middle-aged white guys wearing plaid shirts. It's not. And I'm not discounting the impact of agriculture because I know somewhere out there, Gwen, you're listening, but ag is responsible for about 18.2% of our sectoral employment in, in rural places. If you get into rural Northern Ontario, I dare you to find good broadband. I dare you to find online resources. And yet they're still all rural. So don't just check a box saying we have rural uh, representation on some sort of organization or some sort of response because we're different you know and bonnie you and i live in very very similar size communities and you know we're super lucky but i'm sure we both have gone through some very you know you know as everybody does some challenges and if anybody seems to think that what is going to work for bonnie is going to work for me simply because we come from rural places you are fooling yourselves Mm -hmm. So what is happening in rural places is happening everywhere. Uh, don't just give a one size fits all response when you're trying to develop a response to it. You know, across the board, as everybody on this call, I think probably knows, I ran a really large survey. We have about 30,000 responses. And on average, we saw an 84% decrease in mental health, self-reported mental health. You know, and then you tease it out and you're like rural gender, rural age, rural age and gender. And it all has to be considered if you're going to be able to not only adequately, but appropriately respond to what people need. And that's urban too, but rural, because it is a smaller population, those changes are really, really drastic sometimes. So if you've got a small population and mom and dad are going through something, because it is impacting younger people more under 40. Mom and dad have kids at home. Mom and dad have jobs, they're paying mortgages, they're paying bills. And then suddenly it is quite a, a big, big impact that's societal. And the idea that I, as a male, should just lean on my pal because guys don't talk about things, it needs to change. And the concept around uh, the question you asked Bonnie around uh, mental health, it just shouldn't be stigmatized the same way it is, you know, and it, it simply is male suicide in rural areas are, are much, much higher than they are in urban centers. And all of this has to be considered when we have these conversations. Yeah, no, thank, thanks, Lee. I appreciate that because part of what was reflected in our June 2020 study was the fact that so few had access to formal support and we can even link that to your current study on the Be Well, Work Well. It's similar um, statistics there. I do want to highlight too, which is interesting, and I want to know what your thoughts are on this and whether or not you think rural healthcare workers are wanting to be heard. Because not only are we doing this study and you've got your 30,000 case survey, the Be Well, Work Well, the highest participation rate was from the healthcare and social services sector. Yep. So I think, I, I, I think of course, you've got a group of uh, healthcare professionals that are like, guys, we're tired. Like we're super tired and I think everybody on this call knows a nurse and they're tired, they're exhausted. But the reality is that they were exhausted. You know, we never had enough nurses, let alone in rural places. And I think that the current government, the newly elected government is gonna be like, hey, here's, you know, 25,000 new nurses. Thanks guys, they're all gonna to go to Toronto. So what are we going to do about allocation of health resources in small and rural places? And that's, that's the critical question here. You know, and I do think health workers want to be heard, but I think that shouldn't be the goal. The goal should to be sure that, or should be to just let, let's have a conversation about things. Let's see if if we can have resources available in the work well, be well study, do a well, work well study. 30% of participants said that they sought help. 70% said they didn't. Yeah. Why? Because they want to handle it themselves. And you know what? I've got a lot of great friends, but I have no training, no background in mental health support you know and so you wonder how well am i able to do it and in rural context you've got i belong to the church and i'm not down playing churches but they are not mental health uh, professionals either you know and it is a it's a critical skill that just needs the recognition of you know you would never say here's a new bridge let's see what happens you would hire some engineers and it's really really important that we start to recognize that
Yeah, no, thank, thanks, Leith. I appreciate that. Just want to highlight one comment from Amanda in the chat and knowing that we probably have another five minutes or so. So feel free, if you do have any questions, feel free to uh, type it in the chat there. Um, but Amanda was just sharing that uh, she works in public health in rural Northern Ontario and a lot of the findings today resonate with her experience with what she's seen and heard from human health resources in their region. The North is also experiencing a temporal delay for each wave compared to Southern Ontario, which lengthened our overall response. These findings would likely be of use to all rural, of all of rural Ontario, especially public health units. Public Health Ontario and Ontario Health to support pandemic recovery and future emergency response planning. So thank you, Amanda, for that. I uh, I have one other thing to add. So I've been, uh, we're just in the early stages of a new project uh, led out of, um, not led out of Guelph, which is, which is great to expand us. And it's looking at the integration, the direct integration of mental health supports for healthcare workers, specifically in nursing. It's a recognition that I think, you know, just because you're in the health field doesn't mean you don't need help. So it is a full integration right from the get go. And I think ultimately you're going to need to have a system change here that recognizes just like going to the dentist, just like going to the doctor, you need to make sure that you're kind of, you know, doing what you can, which means normalizing this when people need a little bit of support. Yeah, and I was thinking, you know, when we talk about healthcare, um, all of those other people, um, those other professionals and people who are engaged in healthcare, so our admin staff, like who's talking to our admin staff? Who's yeah. talking to people who are on um, meal prep or, you know, uh, cleaning up rooms? And, and have we spoke to those folks? They're part of our, those, those professionals are part of the healthcare system. And I used to always say our admin staff were the glue of public health. You know, um, those professionals also, um, not to take away from our nurses and, and doctors, but they, they were the glue during the pandemic. They are the glue in our organizations. And I think it's really important that we care for everyone within those environments. There's yes. my soapbox. No, it's a great it's a great point, Bonnie. In that sense, a hundred percent. In it, in Leith had mentioned the systems. You know that we have to. It's really a systems approach here. Mm -hmm. There are actually a, a few questions in the Q and A. Um, Brian was asking about the hero stigma. It seems like an oxymoron. <laughs> Can you explain what the respondents who use the term implied by it? And thanks. Um, and how do we prevent it from happening? So really that, yeah, you're right. Hero stigma does sound like an oxymoron there, but um, it is what is coming from participants. Everyone knows and uh, is connected to the hero label because that has been splashed throughout the pandemic through media and through our thanks and so forth. But it is, I think, in the long term with the burnout that is happening, it is becoming that stigma. And as I had said earlier, it's kind of like a hero, a lonely hero trying to go above and beyond through, uh, you know, facing incredible odds. And so there's a lot of guilt tied into always going, 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 even when they need to take a break there. So I hope that helps respond, uh, re respond to that nicely, uh, Brian there. And then uh, also the question about uh, any incidences of healthcare workers finding that the grocery store shopping trips become a series of requests for diagnosis. Absolutely, that has been reflected in some of the stories that people are talking about. And uh, Dan was asking, uh, or said, you've gleaned an incredible amount of information on the impact of COVID on the healthcare provider community. How do you see using this data to change how the next pandemic or crisis is less impactful on our health personnel? It's a great question, Dan, because we are still in the pandemic, right? So it's so funny, not funny, but we talk about future disruptive planning, right? And even the Be Well Work Well study is very much focused on that. But it's like we're, we're talking about it like it's over and done with and that we can do uh, post assessment, but we are still in the midst of it. For my sense, you know, I can see this being a longitudinal study to see how people are in a year from now or two years from now and kind of just seeing the how how they have been faring in terms of how we use this information. I think it is important to have their voices heard. You know, um, we will be doing a report conference presentations, as well as seeing where we can submit this report, maybe at various government and public health uh, units and so forth. So hope that helps Dan with that. And the last question, and hopefully, uh, Sam, we have one more minute here. Does the emphasis put on healthcare and social sector workers for self-care and mutual care, in fact, put all of them into situations where they're being asked to work beyond their qualifications and where social awkwardness, there's social awkwardness in those conversations? 
Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. It's almost, as I said, you know, there's that one comment, the care should not be asking for care, right? Or I don't, you know, we shouldn't be burning the, you know, the mental health system because others need it. So I think there's a little bit of that pressure that they put on themselves. And then to know that being a healthcare worker, they do almost have to talk that talk in terms of self-care and how they're managing and so forth. But I think we know that they're not that there is the challenge um, and that they are exhausted and that pandemic burnout piece is very, very real. Okay, Go ahead, fantastic. Sam. <laughs> so that's perfect timing for us here. I'm just gonna do some closing remarks. So first of all, a big thank you to you, Cassandra, as well as Bonnie and Leith for being here and having this discussion. It's such an important topic and you know, we are all very lucky um, at Gateway and all the people attending today to be able to get access to this information before it's even, you know, been fully um, gone through. So, you know, good to get a little sneak peek here. Um, and I really hope that, you know, this is a topic that's really near and dear to the hearts of everybody at Gateway. And I hope that today's talk has helped some of our viewers, you know, take on some of that passion and insight as well. Um, and I just want to say a huge thank you to our sponsors as well for making this lecture series possible. Um, so I'd like to thank CIBC Private Wealth Management, the Jagger Town Square IDA Pharmacy, Libro Credit Union, the Town of Godrich, McEwen and Fagan Insurance Brokers, and Zayers of Godrich uh, for their continued to support. Uh, without you, the lecture series would not be possible. So big thank you to all of them. Um, and I just want to mention that Gateway Center of Excellence in Rural Health is also a not-for-profit organization with charitable status. Uh, and we do greatly appreciate and welcome any support that we receive. Uh, it's what makes all that we do possible. Um, and uh, another thing is just a thank you to everybody who is attending today. You know, it's, it's great to see the engagement in the chat and in the Q&A and just the sheer number of people that are here taking time out of their day to hear this and, you know, take on the knowledge and be part of the conversation. That's greatly appreciated. Um, and whether you've been here from the very beginning or you're just joining us for the first time today, uh, we really do appreciate the engagement and the support. Uh, and then a special note for all the people who have been here from the beginning um, is that this is the final lecture of the semester. Um, so if you've been here from January until now and you've had perfect attendance, I wanna give you a big round of applause. Um, that's incredible to see the engagement and the commitment to being here uh, each month. And you will be receiving a certificate of completion from Gateway. Um, you know, so you can start picking out your frame to hang it on your wall now. Um, and that should be coming out sometime, you know, late next week as when we hope to be able to send them off. Um, and just to let you know, looking forward, the lecture series will be taking a break over the summer. Uh, so there won't be any lectures in July or August, summer break for everybody. Um, but we are gonna be starting back up in September and we're looking at September 13th. So it's not the first Tuesday, but it's the second Tuesday. We'll give you a bit of a buffer after Labor Day weekend there to get things back on track. Um, let me just look over my notes here, make sure I'm not missing anything. <laughs> yes, and also please feel free to pass uh, the information along about the lecture series to your networks. Um, you know, it is all about continuing to pro promote that knowledge economy, reduce social isolation, and support Gateway's mission of improving the health and quality of life of rural residents. So the more people that we can have engaged, the better. Uh, we also do post these uh, recordings to our website. It's Gateway Rural Health, um, and you can go on there if you want to see the recording of this session or any of our past sessions as well. Uh, and with that, I will officially wrap up the first year and a half of Gateway's Rural Health Lecture Series. So I'll just do a big clap out with the panelists and Cassandra here for everybody that was here. Um, and thank you so much for the engagement. It really does mean a lot from myself and everybody at Gateway. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Enjoy your day. Bye. Bye.